I am honored and delighted to be delivering the 2021 Solomon Lecture, but I'm even more so looking forward to being in Australia in person in the not too distant future, I hope. So in the early 1730s, a young publisher in Philadelphia would give the postal courier two things, copies of his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, and a big fat wad of banknotes. The young printer's name was Benjamin Franklin. Now the paper thrived under Franklin's leadership thanks to his witty style and his politically astute articles. They managed to stay just on this side of the revolutionary line vis-a-vis -vis the British overlords. At the time, a colonial postmaster could decide at his own discretion which newspapers were sent free of charge to the mail and which were not. So in order to circulate his paper, Franklin had no choice but to bribe the then postmaster. But later in 1736, Franklin himself became the regional postmaster and he put an end to the corruption. Now all newspapers in colonial Pennsylvania would be distributed on equal terms. And from then on, the Pennsylvania Gazette's cir circulation grew. During the Second Continental Congress, Franklin advanced the cause of establishing an independent United States Postal Service. And in 1775, he was named the first US Postmaster General. Thanks to his influence, the Constitution explicitly mentioned an independent postal service and made it a federal agency. The Postal Service Act II bore Franklin's handiwork. It required the Postal Service to deliver all newspapers on equal terms throughout the country. The U.S. Post became an irrevocable element of the founding of the United States and its democracy. Access to information is the foundation of democratic decision-making and democratic governance. And we have to prize access to information if we're to counter power asymmetries and eliminate undue information-based digital domination. This is the key argument of a new book coming out this fall called Access Rules, Freeing Data from Big Tech in a Better Future by Victor Maya Schoenberger and Thomas Ramke. They argue that governments need to open up their own data and compel information giants to share their treasure troves of data with others. We have to open access to information to all, they say, citizens and scientists, startups and established companies, as well as the public sector and NGOs. And they're absolutely right. Access to data, and here I'm of course preaching to the choir, from both government and business is vital to solve public problems. We need to proactively enforce the obligation to share anonymized data openly and to make state collected administrative data accessible, subject to appropriate restrictions and safeguards, if we're going to address the challenges of our time in an evidence-based way. Just today in my own work, we're discussing how we can design a policy of lifelong learning. We're giving away $10 million in state funding to pilot lifelong learning accounts to promote upskilling among workers. But to know who should receive the benefit in order to promote equity and economic growth demands that we both collect and use data to design an informed policy and then measure its impact. But what I'm here today to argue is that even when we have access to data, we still need to learn how to use data to solve public problems. The adoption of data-driven practices reflects a relatively new way of working that seeks to collect, analyze, use, and share data, not simply to comply with requirements, but also to affect rapid change and performance improvement. But such skills are not innate. They must be learned. However, while data science programs are proliferating across universities and across businesses, the traditional training academies for public administration, whether it's public affairs and public policy schools or commissions of civil service, they don't regularly train graduates in data science. Of the top 25 public policy schools as ranked by US News and World Report in 2019, none required to take even basic coursework in data science. In a proposal to create a data science curriculum for prospective public administrators at Cornell University's Institute for Public Affairs, authors Elizabeth Day, Maria Fitzpatrick, and Thomas O'Toole argue that if policy analysis cannot work with data scientists to create systems adequately designed to address policy needs, those systems will never be created. To create and implement policy effectively will require all public servants and people in public affairs related occupations to truly understand data's promise and pitfalls and how to use it effectively. 
It's not surprising, therefore, that in a 2014 survey of 283 federal employees, 78% of respondents said that data were integral to their roles. But more than 60% reported that their agencies were either ineffective or only somewhat effective at using data. In a 2019 survey that my colleagues and I conducted of 400 local officials in the United States, only a third said that they had used the skill of data analytical thinking in their work. And a further third said they could explain what it was, but hadn't used it. I also worked with Rod Glover at Monash University to survey public servants in Australia. We found a little bit better story, 59% that they had used the skill of data analytical thinking. Yet, only 25% said they had received formal training in it. And that might help to explain why 40% of those who claimed to use the skill did not know how to formulate a hypothesis, which is the first step in data analysis. While 68% said they knew how to identify the data needed to test a hypothesis, that means 30 plus percent did not. In other words, there are questionable gaps in people's knowledge and skills. And these shortcomings in data literacy are not unique to the public sector. A 2018 LinkedIn workforce report in the United States found that demand for data scientists was off the charts. And there was a gap, however, of 151,000 data scientist jobs that were going unfulfilled. So it's vital to introduce more people, especially in the public sector, to understand how information can be used to solve public problems, as well as to tools for applying data analytical methods responsibly and ethically. So let's start by addressing briefly how better data and information can be used to help solve public problems, and then we'll turn to talking about methods. We can use access to data and information to spot mistakes, outliers, and rare events, and to help us target scarce resources more effectively. First, access to data sometimes helps us to achieve greater government accountability. In the United States and in Australia, where we have opened access to government spending data, that's facilitated the creation of tools that allow us to explore our budgets and spot fraud, waste, and abuse. But opening data has also helped, for example, to spot discrimination. In Zanesville, Ohio, looking at data about water provisioning revealed a 50-year 50 50 year record of discrimination in Muskegon County, where residents of the predominantly African American area of Zanesville, Ohio, were not able to access clean city water. They had to drive to get to their, their water or had to buy it. It was only, however, by looking at the data that the truth was laid bare and that led to a successful civil rights lawsuit against Zanesville in 2008. Access to data can also improve the delivery of services at the state and at the local as well as at the national level. Increasing access to data has allowed entrepreneurs and developers as well as governments to build tools such as smart transit apps, citizen facing information services, or business and government facing data visualization and analysis platforms. For example, data can help us to target scarce enforcement resources more effectively. Take the city of Chicago, which has more than 15,000 food establishments, but only three dozen food inspectors. Chicago city government has used its data on restaurant inspections to create an algorithm to predict food safety violations. This led to an increase in the effectiveness of inspections and a decrease of foodborne illness by 25%. We, by, uh, let's take another example quickly from Chicago. The travel patterns of rats, something virtually impossible to predict, making rat infestations in large cities difficult to tackle. So similarly, Chicago, which saw a peak in its rodent population about a decade ago after receiving 25,000 rodent complaints, took the call center data that it had, and it gave that to Daniel Neal. Daniel Neal, who was then at the Carnegie Mellon University's Advent and Pattern Detection Lab, he's now a computer scientist at NYU. Together, the city and Daniel gathered 12 years of call data that included information on rat sightings, but also other related factors, such as overflowing trash bins, food poisoning cases, tree debris, and building vacancies. They quickly discovered, thanks to this data that was re that related to food and shelter, that these were the data elements that would be the strongest predictors of rat infestations. That allowed them to build a model to predict spikes in rodent complaints days before the infestation would actually happen. 
something we saw repeated using data during COVID, where we use that data to do similar kinds of prediction in order to get ahead of our needs for ventilators and PPE. So Chicago was able to reduce its rat infestation or its complaints about rat infestation by 20%. And when it then was able to predict infestation and take further measures to further drop the need for rodent control services the next year by 15%. Access to data also enables the creation of tools to improve consumer choice and citizen decision making as well. For example, data collected by the government from universities in the United States has been transformed by our Department of Education into a calculator. It's called the College Scorecard. It's designed to help parents and students make more informed financial decisions about pe their people's own college education. Sometimes the benefits of access to data ripple out far beyond government accountability. And at least in this country, access to data is usually made, requests come from companies more than they come from investigative journalists. Those demands for data and the access to data has helped create things like the GPS industry, as well as the business of weather apps, as well as the biotech industry, all of which have benefited from access to government data. New proactive disclosure rules, the whole regime of open data we've had for the last decade, have helped to make more information available. But of course we know sometimes it's not enough. That's why we need freedom of information access laws and sunshine laws to enable activists like Carl Malamud of publicresource.org to sue our Inland Revenue Service, the IRS, to request nonprofit tax returns. Now the law requires that nonprofit tax returns be publicly made available. But previously the IRS had typically been taking those electronically filed returns, printing them out, scanning them back in, and then creating DVDs with image files and selling them to the public. Malamud sued for access to this data in digitally readable form. And as a result of his winning court case, not only were those nine returns made available, but now all nonprofit tax return data is made available in the Amazon cloud in a digitally readable format. That allows us to process and use the data to gain insights about the nonprofit sector. One, uh, in addition though, to being using the law to gather data, we also can use crowdsourcing and new technology to help us gather and make data accessible in new ways. After the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant disaster in Japan in 2011, SafeCast, a group of distrustful citizens dissatisfied with the data provided by the government, crowdsourced what has now become the world's largest air quality and radiation quality mo monitoring project in the world. Using homemade Geiger counters, they were able to collect better data than the government had itself, and in fact, give that data back to the government to inform its own work. Not all data, though, is going to be freely open. Obviously, there's administrative data that includes personally identifiable data that will not be freely available under open access rules. But we still need mechanisms to provide access, especially to government as well as researchers, to that data about public health, about criminal arrests, about recidivism, about healthcare, and about education. When we use that data that's reported back to the state, we can use that, again, with safeguards for privacy, of course, and for security. When we can use that data, then we can gain insights and solve problems in new ways. That's why many institutions have created data labs or policy labs. Data analysts usually working inside or in tandem with government agencies to make administrative data more usable for evaluation and research. And while organizations vary widely in their implementation of administrative data, all of these have developed models and skills for making talent, data analytical talent, available to people as well as data. Federal, state, and local governments regularly collect personally identifiable as well as public data in the process of administering public programs. It can include things also like records of children in foster care, recipients and amounts of unemployment benefits, tax and arrest records. This kind of social service data in particular can be used to improve the delivery of services by analyzing the timeliness and efficiencies of benefit delivery. Especially when combined with other data sets, such as administrative data can also be used to assess outcome of services. For example, New Jersey's Training Explorer project 
aims to connect up data about state-approved training programs with records of who took those training programs and their tax data to learn whether uh, someone who took a course saw their income go up or go down. That allows us to decide and individuals to decide on whether they should pursue certain training programs. To realize the benefits of administrative data, however, requires successful collection of desired, unbiased, and informative data, secure cloud infrastructure to store this private information, and above all, the governance policies and protocols to facilitate sharing and use of data across jurisdictions and sectors, including engagement with communities to ensure legitimacy and trust, especially in connection with the collection and sharing of personally identifiable data it's definitely worth noting, however, that most governmental data collection and storage is done today for purposes of reporting and compliance, rather than for the more important purpose, I would say, of evaluation or innovation. And both the infrastructure and the governance to facilitate data integration, analysis, and use are often missing. In addition, however, to that lack of infrastructure, lack of skills is a really, really important impediment to using data to improve performance. Whether it's national, state, or local agencies, we often lack the human resources, the statistical and analytical expertise necessary to integrate administrative data. So even if we're not trained data scientists, we want to develop skills for first defining a problem that we're solving and doing so with data. That requires being able to articulate a problem and its root causes, or put in a, another way, articulating what our hypothesis is for why a problem is occurring. Then we need to develop skills for identifying the appropriate data to prove or disprove our hypothesis, finding that data, and then using appropriate data analytical methods or collaborating with those who have them. So perhaps we have a hypothesis, for example, about one, why unemployment is occurring. Perhaps we think it's because robots are eating our jobs. Or maybe we think it's because interest rates are increasing and the cost of capital is going up. Often the hypothesis includes a theory of change about the best way to solve the problem. Perhaps our hypothesis is that we're going to improve healthcare by spending more on preventive medicine, such as an annual checkup, or rather than after the fact procedures, because the root cause of poor health is a lack of attention to diet. This problem definition defines the problem in a way that gets at the underlying behavioral hypothesis about which behaviors lead to better health. But in short, it's really vital to have the skills for learning how to define the problem and to do so with data at every step of the problem solving process, from idea to implementation to evaluation and scale. The most successful problem solvers, however, combine qualitative and quantitative approaches to defining a problem. Let me take one final example here. In an effort to reduce the city's murder rate, Mitch Landrieu, who was then the mayor of New Orleans, created a unit in city government dubbed the Innovation Team, or I-Team, whose job it was to tackle the problem of increased homicides. Using, using data on murder rate, crime rate, educational attainment, unemployment rate, and recidivism rate, organized by neighborhood and dating all the way back to 1960, the team uncovered a significant correlation between unemployment and violent crime, and thus recidivism. The data showed that a majority of murders in New Orleans were committed by a small and identifiable set of people in a few neighborhoods as a result of petty disputes. Although New Orleans still suffers from one of the highest homicide rates in the nation, the team's work led to a decline in the murder rate by 20% between 2012 and 2013, and the number continues to drop. In 2018, murders in New Orleans were at their lowest levels in almost 50 years. But it wasn't just access to quantitative information that made the difference. It was adding qualitative information that improved outcomes dramatically. It's one of thousands of recent examples about how governments, civil society leaders, and social innovation leaders are mining newly available data to improve how services are delivered. And they're representative of a major push in recent years to embrace evidence-based decision making. But in New Orleans, they did something special and different. They also sat down with law enforcement, social service agencies, educators, and above all, residents themselves to develop their solutions. The combination of careful data analysis and human-centered ways of working, during which officials talked to and worked with the public, 
is what led to the development of social services that actually worked, including the development of various employment programs for ex-offenders and the formerly incarcerated. Thus, developing an understanding of the value of data and methods for using data and information, and by this I mean both qualitative and quantitative information, is vital for solving public problems. And for those of you who want to go deeper into learning these skills that I've just mentioned today and who would like access to tools and worksheets, we have a free course available at solvingpublicproblems.org. It's a precursor to a course we'll be doing with ANZOG and Monash in Australia later this year. The most forward-leaning governments are investing in public sector upskilling, creating the impetus, incentive, and opportunity for more public servants and residents to you learn how to use data, information, and collaboration. We're living in pretty dark times. Crisis builds upon crisis. We have challenges both acute and chronic. And we could be forgiven for thinking our society is really facing an existential crisis, as is our planet. But I would argue today that this is not so. The tools to solve the deepest problems of our society and our democracy are in our hands and those tools include massive quantities of data and information. If only we have the skills to be able to take advantage of and use this data. So it's incumbent upon all of us to develop our ability and our know-how to leverage data. If we can do so, then I would argue we can raise this world into, this wounded world into a wondrous one. And we can dramatically increase trust and confidence in government and in civil society to solve the challenges that we face today. Thank you.